Welcome to The Breakdown. My name is Umu. I'm a fellow in the Assembly Disinformation Program at the Berkman Science Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. Our topic of discussion today continues uh, the discussion of the election. And in this particular episode, we want to talk about domestic actors, some of their um, patterns of manipulation, the methods that they use, and what their objectives are. I am joined today and thrilled to be joined today by Joan Donovan, who is the research director of the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy. Dr. Donovan leads the field in examining internet and technology studies, online extremism, media manipulation, and disinformation campaigns. Thank you, Joan, for joining us. Really excited Thank to, you. to talk about this stuff today. So our discussion today centers on domestic actors and their um, goals in purveying disinformation. And it, we would be remiss if not to mention that at the time of this recording, just last night, the president fired Chris Krebs, who is the head of CISA um, at DHS, the agency within the federal government that takes the lead on countering, mitigating, and responding to disinformation, particularly as it relates to democratic processes like elections. Joan, what do you sort of make of uh, this late night firing, this uh, last minute uh, de development? Um, you know, if you study disinformation long enough, it, you you feel like you're you're looking through a crystal ball in, in some instances. So we all we all knew it was coming. Uh, even you know Krebs had, had said so much, um, and that's because uh, countering disinformation is uh, you know it's a it's a really thankless job, in the sense that um, you know it wasn't just the fact that uh, Krebs was had built uh, an agency that over the course of the last few years really had flown under the radar in terms of any kind of partisan divides had done a lot of work to ensure election security and cared about the question of disinformation, misinformation, as it applied to questions about election integrity, right? So CISA and Krebs wasn't trying to dispel all of the, the crazy myths and, and conspiracies out there, but they were uh, doing their part within their remit to make sure that any kind of theory about voter fraud was something that they took seriously and took the time to debunk. And so it wasn't necessarily just the, the kinds of tweets that were coming out of CISA, but it was really about this website uh, that they had put together that was really a kind of uh, low budget version of Snopes in the sense that uh, the website's called Rumor Control. And the idea was very simple, which was provide very rapid um, analysis of any um, conspiracy or uh, allegation of election fraud that was starting to reach a tipping point, not everything, but things that started to get covered in, in different areas, different covered by journalists, and to give people an anchor that says, this is what we know to be true at this moment. Um, of course, as the president has come to refute the election results, uh, rather forcefully online, Krebs's role became uh, much more important as a vocal critic uh, and with, with uh, the truth on his side. And over the last few weeks, um, especially the last week, we've seen Trump move anybody out of his way that would uh, either contradict him in public mm -hmm. or would um, seriously imperil his desire to stay in the White House. That um, makes me think of something that I think about a lot uh, recently, particularly over the last four years, but especially in 2020, is this use of disinformation as political strategy by uh, the GOP. Um, it seems like, you know, for one, one pillar of that strategy is just one, to spread disinformation. The second is to sort of leverage our institutions to legitimize the, the information that they're spreading. And the third is just to accelerate truth to gay in a matter that's um, advantageous to the GOP's particular political aims. How do you respond to that? And how do you think the information ecosystem should be organizing around that problem? That this is that we have a major political party in the United States for whom this is strategy for them. Yeah. They're really just leveraging the communication opportunities in our current media ecosystem to get their messaging across. Um, and in this instance, uh, when we know where the propaganda is coming from, that is, it's coming from the White House, it's coming from 
Giuliani. It's coming from Bannon. It's coming from uh, Roger Stone. H- how then do we reckon with it? Because we actually know what it is. So the, the concept uh, of white propaganda is really important here because when we know what the source is, we can treat it differently. However, uh, you know, the difference between something like what went down in 2016 and what happened in 2020 is, is uh, an evolution of these strategies to uh, use, you know, some automated uh, techniques in order to increase engagement on certain posts so that more people see them, coupled with uh, serious, serious money and influence in order to make uh, disinformation travel further and faster. Mm-hmm. Uh, the third thing uh, about this communication strategy in this moment is that um, it really uh, the problem really transcends social media at this point, where we do have our more legitimate uh, institutions starting to bow out and say, you know what, we're not even going to try to tackle this. We're like it, for us, it's not even an issue. Uh, because we're not going to play into allegations that there's voter fraud. Uh, we're not going to play into, you know, any of these pet theories that have emerged about hammer and scorecard and dominion. And if you've heard any of those keywords, then you've, you've encountered uh, <laughs> disinformation. Um, but it does go to show that we are in, immersed in a hyperpartisan media ecosystem where the future of journalism is at stake. The future of social media is at stake. And uh, right now, I'm really worried that the you know U.S. democracy might not survive this moment. I completely agree with you. Um, and that is a really scary thing to think. Can you talk a little bit about sites like Parler, Discord, Telegram, Gab? Um, just recently after the election, um, Facebook disbanded a group called Stop the Steal, and then many of those followers found a new home on Parler. Why are sites like this so attractive to people who have a history of creating affinity around conspiracy theories? So I think about Gab, for instance, uh, me and Brian Friedberg and Becca Lewis wrote about Gab post um, the Unite the Right rally, because Gab really put a lot of energy into recruiting white supremacists who were being removed from platforms for terms of service violations. And they were basically saying, we're the free speech platform and we don't care what you say. And for Gab, that, you know, went ass overhead pretty fast where they did have to start banning white supremacists because unfortunately what you get when you make a platform that uh, emphasizes lack of moderation is you get uh, some of the worst kind of pornography Uh, you can ever imagine. No style, no grace, nothing sexy about it. Just, you know, here's a bunch of people in diapers, right? Like, it's just, it's just not good. And so right now, uh, um, you know, these minor apps that are saying we're on, we're unmoderated, come, come one, come all are actually facing a pretty strong uh, content moderation problem where trolls are now showing up pretending to be celebrities there's uh, lots and lots of screenshots out there where people think they heard from some celebrity on uh, on one of these apps, and it's really just a troll uh, with a fake account. And so, but this moment is an opportunity for these apps to grow, and they will say and do anything in order to capture that market segment. Mm-hmm. But if we think about infrastructure as both as as all three things, the technology. The people that uh, bring the technology together, including the audiences and the policies, right now we're having a crisis of stability in terms of content moderation policies. And so people are seeking out other platforms that increase that kind of stability in their messaging because they want to know why they're seeing what they're seeing and they want, you know, to, to, for those rules to be really clear. Picking up on that um, content moderation thread to talk about uh, larger and sort of more legacy tech platforms um, more broadly, um, what is your sense of how well content moderation and maybe even more specifically labeling um, efforts work? We saw Twitter um, and some of the other platforms too do a pretty, I think, comparatively good job when you compared with the past. Um, of slapping labels on the president's tweets, um, but that's because there was such a, an expectation that there would be 
premature claims of victory. Um, what's your sense of how well it minimizes virality? Um, so we don't really know or have any data to conclude that the labeling is really doing anything other than aggravating people. Yeah. Um, which is to say that, you know, we thought that the labeling was going to result in massive reduction in virality. Um, in some instances, you see influencers taking photos or just screenshots of their the labels on their tweets on Twitter. Uh, at venues saying like, look, it's happening to me as a kind of badge of honor. Um, but at the same time, they do, when done well, they convey the right kind of message. Unfortunately, I don't think any of us anticipated the amount of labels that were going to be needed on key public figures, right? And so you imagine, I imagine that, you know, okay, they're going to do these labels for folks that have over 100,000 uh, followers on Twitter, uh, or, you know, they're going to show up on YouTube and, and in ways that deal with, you know, the, the, both the, the claims of voter fraud, but also the virality. But it's hard to say if anybody's clicking through on these labels, I've clipped through some of them and the information on the other side of the label is totally irrelevant. That is, it's, uh, it's just not about the tweet or any, it's not specific enough. Yeah. Um, which is to say that, uh, you know, in watching the, the tech hearing this week, Dorsey seemed to not really be committed to a content moderation policy that deals with misinformation at scale. Mm -hmm. And as a result, what you get is these half measures that we don't really know what their effect is going to be. And for the partners in the fact-checking world that par partnered with Facebook, they're now under a deluge of, um, you know, uh, allegations that they're somehow partisan and they've been weaponized in a, in a bunch of different ways. And so I don't even know what the, uh, the broad payout is to risk your reputation as a news organization to do that kind of fact-checking uh, on Facebook where Facebook isn't really committed to removing um, certain kinds of misinformation. Joan, why is medical mis and disinformation different than other types of information we see circulating maybe related to elections or, or other democratic processes? Um, so when we think about medical misinformation, we're really thinking about, well, how quickly are people gonna change their behavior, right? If you hear that coronavirus is uh, in the water, you're going to stop drinking water, right? If you hear that it's in the air, you're going to put a mask on. And that. so the way in which people receive me medical advice, really, it can stop them on a dime uh, and move them in a different direction. And unfortunately, we've entered into this situation where uh, medical advice has been uh, polarized in, in our hyperpartisan media environment. And there's been some recent studies that can even show the degree to which that polarization is happening that uh, is, is really leading people to downplay the risks of COVID-19. And this has a lot to do with them encountering misinformation uh, from what they might consider even trusted sources. Hmm. And so when we think about the design of social media in this moment, we actually have to think about a curation strategy for the truth. We need access to information that is timely, local, relevant, and accurate. And if we don't get that kind of information today, um, people are going to continue to die because they don't understand what the real risk is. They don't understand how they can protect themselves. And especially as we enter into this holiday season where a lot of people are starting to relax their uh, vigilance and are, are hoping that it's, it won't happen to them. That's in the exact moment where we need to crank up the health messaging mm -hmm. and make sure that uh, people understand the risks and have seen uh, some form of true and correct information about COVID-19. Because I'll tell you right now, if you go on social media and you start poking around, Sure, there's a couple of, you know, interstitials or there's a couple of banners here and there, but we can do a lot better to make sure that people know what COVID-19 is, what the symptoms are, how to get tested, how to keep yourself safe, and how to keep your, your loved ones safe as well. 
I'm just curious, what are the sorts of data points you've seen that would explain why some people, you know, don't necessarily uh, subscribe to, um, you know, believe, uh, information from authoritative sources about the spread of COVID-19, mitigations you can take, not, you know, hanging out with family members and such and such and this. Why, why, do, why do people, why are people, why are some people inclined not to believe that authoritative information? It's a good question. And, you know, part of it has to do with the echo chambers that they've been getting information in for years. Uh, we've started to see certain Facebook groups that maybe it's a local Facebook group and you've been in it a long time and it, you know, is about exchanging, you know, like of the free list, you know, exchanging things in your neighborhood. And then people slowly start to talk about these really important issues and misinformation is introduced through a blog post or an article. So, um, or, you know, I saw this on the, uh, on the quote unquote news and you find out that they've been watching one of these hyper-partisan news sources that um, is downplaying what's happening. And so you kind of see it in the ephemera, but in Harvard, uh, our journal, the Harvard Kennedy Misinfo Review, we've definitely, we've published research around, even within the right-wing media ecosystem, the degree to which someone um, watches a lot of, let's say, Hannity versus Tucker they're going to have different uh, associations with the risk of COVID-19 because yeah. it's covered differently yeah. by these, um, these, uh, these uh, folks that are at the same outlet. And so it's really important to understand that this has to do with the communication environment that is designed and the fact that people are really trying when they're sharing things that are novel or outrageous, or um, you know, things that might be uh, medically incorrect. They're doing it in some cases out of out of love. Uh, they're doing it just in case. Maybe you didn't see this, and uh, it's an unfortunate situation that we've gotten ourselves into, where the more outrageous the conspiracy theory, the more outlandish the claim, the the more viral it tends to be, and that's. Uh, an unfortunate consequence of the design of these systems. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me today, Joan. I really enjoyed our conversation. It's great. Thank you so much. Thank I really you. appreciate you, you doing yes. these series.